It's now the afternoon of August 14th, 2007. We're going to talk to Don Linke, who started in the Byrne administration as an assistant counsel, became director of policy and planning, and at the end of Byrne's second term, did both that job and chief counsel. Don, how did you come to be part of the Byrne administration? Uh, it was pretty much an accident. Uh, I was practicing law with a Newark law firm. Uh, our firm had a divorce case against another uh, Newark firm. Uh, I was assigned to this divorce case. It was a wealthy couple that lived in uh, Short Hills. Uh, and the associate who was representing uh, our uh, adversary in the case for uh, the other law firm was John Degnan. Uh, so John and I were assigned usually to the uh, fairly minor chores of the divorce case when the partners thought it wasn't worth their time to do things and uh, we got to know each other opposing each other uh, in this divorce uh, proceeding. Uh, so I got to know John um, and one day I called him to complain about something that their client had done or not done. And he told me, he said, Don, he said, I hate this case. And uh, by the way, I'm leaving the firm in a couple of weeks, uh, so I won't have to deal with it anymore. And I also hated the case too. So I asked him, I said, well, where are you going? And he said, I've, I've gotten a job in the governor's office, in the governor's counsel's office. Um, and I'm going to start working down there. And I said, gee, I always thought that would be an interesting place to work, but I've never done anything politically, and I don't really know anybody in politics or government. But if you hear of anything, give me a call. And a few months later, he did call and said there was an opening. Uh, I went down and interviewed with Lou Caden, who was the uh, governor's uh, special counsel uh, at the beginning of the Byrne administration and uh, thought it was the worst interview I've ever had in my life. Um, I, first of all, it, it was scheduled for a legislative day. Uh, I think I was supposed to have the interview around 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was sort of put in a little waiting room outside the council's office in the library there. Uh, I saw Lou come in occasionally, go across the hall. Uh, finally, uh, they told me then to go out to lunch, that, you know, keep waiting around. Meanwhile, my firm thought I was somewhere, uh, and I had to keep calling in, getting, making excuses. Uh, finally got in, I think, around 5.30 to see Lou. Uh, got into his office, and the council's office used to have this big, ornate wooden desk and there was a big leather reclining chair behind the desk. And Lou was fairly short in stature, and he was sitting behind the desk, leaning back, uh, sort of with his chin into his chest. And Lou, like I do, tends to mumble. Uh, and he asked me a question. I couldn't understand <laughs> what he said. And I asked him to repeat it, uh, and he did. And then the second time, the same thing happened. And I asked him to repeat it, and he did. And then I thought, well, I can't keep asking him to repeat the question because I can't understand what he's saying. So for the rest of the interview, I would watch, and when his lips stopped moving, I would say something. <laughs> and I had no idea whether it was at all relevant to what he was asking me. But I figured I'd just get through this interview and get out the door and the heck with it. Uh, and I literally walked out of that interview saying, you know, there's no possible way I can get this job. But surprisingly, some weeks later, um, I heard from John that uh, they did want me. I assumed that despite my inept performance and uh, miscommunication with Lou, that John was probably lobbying uh, for me. Um, never really asked him about that, but I, I just can't imagine I was hired on the basis of a uh, interview where we were on different wavelengths as to what the, each each of us was saying. What's your background prior to that? Where'd you grow up? I'm a native of Asbury Park, 
went to Asbury Park High School, uh, went away for college at Dartmouth, spent a year abroad at the London School of Economics, and came back, went to Harvard Law School, and then clerked for the uh, state Supreme Court for a year, the last year of the Weintraub Court. For a particular justice? Yes, for Justice Hayden Proctor, who used to have his chambers in Asbury Park. A wonderful man, who a former uh, uh, Senate president, uh, assignment judge in Hudson County, Republican, uh, lived in Interlaken, a native of Ocean Grove. He used to take me over. We'd work Saturday mornings, and after we'd work uh, Saturdays, he would uh, take me over to Ocean Grove, and we'd walk around Ocean Grove, and he would tell me who lived where and the gossip of the families in Ocean Grove and what it was like to live and grow up in Ocean Grove in the old days when it was really a Methodist camp meeting town. Uh, and uh, uh, he was a fascinating, wonderful uh, guy. Also, uh, much different to work for as a judge, as a, as a clerk for a judge, uh, because we would take cases uh, and he would start by asking me to sit across from the desk and sometimes if it was a, tr a complex trial he would have me read the transcript of the trial to him uh, out loud and he would occasionally stop me and say let's note that and put that because we may be able to use that and then he would do the same thing with uh, legal cases uh, where I would read them out loud and he would say, oh, well, let's make a note about that. So you really were um, working with him as an equal uh, in terms of, re of researching and writing the opinions. And I've never really heard of a judge who, who worked like that before. Most law clerks, frankly, spend their time largely in the library looking, researching cases, uh, checking citations and precedents and so forth but very rarely got that type of interactive um, contact with, with the judge that they worked for. Did you join the Byrne administration in 1975? I joined in the summer of 1975, probably at the lowest point of the administration, right after they had lost the income tax for the second time. Uh, in fact, I think I was supposed to start um, maybe on the day of the vote, or something around July 1st or some, somewhere around that period. And I remember John called me and he said, things are so depressing down here, why don't you wait a week or so uh, before you come down? And I did, and uh, started when you know things were looking very bleak uh, for the governor and for the administration. What did you work on initially? My, in, in those days, I think we had four or five assistant councils. And typically, the executive departments were allocated among the four or five assist, assist, assistant councils. And uh, I started, and I succeeded a, an assistant council, a prominent lawyer named Lou Goldshore, uh, uh, who's a, a, a fairly uh, well-known environmental lawyer today. Uh, and Lou, uh, uh, handled, I think, most of the same departments I had. I started with the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Department of Agriculture, I had Civil Defense, uh, I had some authorities, um, and I had um, uh, transportation, for some elements of transportation for, uh, for certain periods. Oh, and uh, occasionally uh, these things shifted as assistant councils came or went. Uh, at some point, I had some elements uh, of other departments, but those were the main departments, environmental protection, agriculture, um, and the uh, authorities, and civil, de civil defense, which also included uh, being the liaison f and for emergencies and di disasters, uh, requests to the uh, White House for disaster assistance, that type of thing. Were there any emergencies or disasters? Oh, yeah, and yeah, they were fun. I enjoyed the disaster work. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, and I learned a lot. I mean, as I when I first came down, I really didn't know. How old were you that year? Gee, I think I was twenty two or three, probably maybe maybe a little older. But um, 
in any event, the emergencies and disasters were interesting because normally under the federal law you'd have to go out and sort of get an estimate of how much damage there was and do this letter to the president from the governor requesting disaster assistance. And when I first started, you know, I did it by the book. I would ask the Department of Transportation, well, how much is it going to cost to fix this highway or bridge or whatever, and go through the other departments and give this inventory. But it would take a long time to do this. And meanwhile, the politics is a situation where you'd have mayors saying, Governor, act, you know, do something, while we were doing the bureaucratic stuff that was supposed to be required under federal law. Uh, to develop these estimates and say it was uh, beyond the state's capabilities to respond on its own. Uh, and we were getting lots of political heat for doing it, and quite rightly, because the people affected and the local public officials were saying, well, come on, let's just act and do it. Uh, and then later I learned that's what you did. You just made up the numbers. You Because it was silly, because most of these numbers uh, were really fabricated out of whole cloth uh, anyway. Um, and also, um, it just didn't really matter. The feds didn't really care either. So when you hear on the news uh, about a disaster somewhere in the United States with estimated damage of uh, $750 million, you immediately think that's a made-up number? Yeah. I'm, I'm always very skeptical about these numbers. It sort of reminds me, I guess, of George Carlin's joke is that when you hear all all these estimates of how many deaths in an earthquake somewhere. Uh, and then that when they reduce them later, he says he's disappointed. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I think all these numbers are pretty much uh, uh, mystical in terms of, because uh, you can't. And you shouldn't be. And uh, that was something I still find somewhat silly in the federal law today, because during a disaster, you shouldn't be doing this type of stuff. You should be helping people. And you know, and providing relief rather than sending out people to do accounting work as to how much it's going to cost. Uh, what department did you work most with? Environmental protection, um, and that was also really uh, fascinating. Uh, David Bardeen was the uh, environmental commissioner. Came on uh, before I was there. Came on early in the administration, not quite at the beginning, but pretty early on, um, succeeded Richard Sullivan, who was um, uh, in the Cahill administration, was very well respected by the environmental community, uh, was viewed as you know one of them in terms of what he was doing with the department. Uh, but Governor Byrne um, uh, decided to offer the job to Dave Bardeen, um, who was uh, a fascinating character. Uh, an Orthodox Jew, had worked in Israel, uh, was a lawyer, um, a full beard, used to wear sandals uh, to work. Uh, and he invited me to participate in almost everything the department did. I sat in on their early Monday morning staff meetings uh, where he would ask for reports from his assistant commissioners and, and division directors. Uh, and he really did, I think, um, give me a, a, almost full access to his key people and would call me you know, frequently for, to, to discuss things. How was he viewed by environmentalists? I think in the beginning, and this again is a little bit before I got there, he was viewed skeptically because they had viewed Sullivan uh, with such uh, esteem. And I think they were a little wary that the Byrne administration was going to Oh, backtrack somewhat on the environment, given that they were not uh, uh, going to continue with Dick Sullivan as head of the department. Uh, I think over time, David reassured them. He was also he also had a very sharp, I think, political feel, and uh, he was very good at that um, in understanding who he should speak to. I think he went out a lot to talk to the environmental groups, uh, so I think he um, he did win them over, but. Uh, there were goals, I think, the governor gave him, and I'm frankly guessing at this, but I've sort of, I think, gotten this indirectly over the years, 
to restructure the department and to improve its efficiency in management and processing permits and just running itself uh, that had fallen um, uh, down, I guess, in the prior years, or at least the perception was that the department wasn't as well managed as it could be. Uh, and it was a large department that had grown, you know, quickly. It was new. It was new. It was really created in the Cahill administration. Um, and uh, it was, um, I think, very difficult. You How know? many people do you think worked in DEP oh, in those gee, days? I don't know. Take uh, a guess. Maybe three, 4,000, but I could be way off. Um, but it was expanding rapidly because the environmental movement was um, you know, looking for new um, objectives. Uh, sewer construction was a major one, particularly during uh, Governor Byrne's first term. Uh, air pollution, solid waste, landfills. I mean, it had a full plate. This you know, department was extremely active, had uh, significant powers, was obviously, you know, a concern to the business community uh, and to others who are now newly regulated from some of these new programs, uh, the Coastal Zone Program, uh, which gave, you know, significant uh, land use authority over the, in, with the department, uh, which was another, which was another program uh, inherited largely from the Cahill administration, but had to be implemented largely during the Byrne administration. So uh, it was a happening place in those days, uh, and David was sort of the ringmaster. Yeah. I mean, he was a colorful character. He used to uh, uh, throw pencils at his staff during the staff meetings if they displeased him on some report or briefing. Uh, and he was viewed by some of them, I think, as a tyrant. I always thought it was somewhat amusing, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I think he had uh, uh, a lot of enemies within the within the bureaucracy, but quite a quite a few supporters. And he and he recruited a top-notch staff. Uh, he brought in some you know people from the outside who really did make a difference in making the department more uh, professional and uh, uh, more of a functioning bureaucracy. At what point? Uh in his term, did the governor uh, order the DEP to process permit applications within 90 days? I think it was almost from the beginning, because uh, I think that was a issue that had come to the governor's attention probably during the 73 campaign, that there was this criticism that the department would take months, if not years, uh, to review permit applications. And they had permit authority over Riparian uh, lands, issuing permits to build a dock, you know, in a backyard for a house. Uh, they had permits, you know, for wetlands, for other um, uh, uh, programs. Uh, they had extensive authority, and a lot of these uh, programs had been, in fact, most of them had been had been passed separately. So the statutes had different criteria. Uh, different standards. It was a very complicated and difficult, I think, management job to put all this together into one coherent whole. How did you enjoy your initial exposure to state government and the governor's office? Oh, it was, it was fascinating. I, I always, I think, thought at the time that uh, you know, this is the best job you'll ever have, so enjoy it now. And I think, in retrospect, that's true. Uh, it was it was exciting. You had access. I mean, I at times I thought, well, gee, I really don't know anything, and I shouldn't have this so much authority or influence over a decision which I really have little background on and really no experience on. And I was always, particularly in those early months. I think worried that I'd make some major mistake, and I'm, I was probably somewhat intimidated by both the people around me and uh, uh, in the issues and the magnitude of what they were asking me to do. Um, but after maybe six months or so, I think I got the feel of what the job entailed, and I felt much more comfortable. And there were always people around you, like John Dagnan or other uh, assistant counsels. Uh, who you could talk to when you had a problem, and th that was sort of reassuring. 
and it was a very close-knit staff. I mean, everybody worked hard. We worked late, uh, you know, lots of times we worked weekends. Um, but everybody, I think, enjoyed what they were doing and uh, really, you know, uh, had a commitment to what the administration was up to. Who were the big personalities in that office? Well, Lou Caden was the chief, was the, they called him the special counsel because, uh, at least I've heard, he wasn't uh, admitted to the New Jersey bar, I think, when he started. So instead of calling him counsel, they called him special counsel. Uh, and, uh, and there was, you know, there were the story. Uh, Lou actually lived in Manhattan and would commute each day down to Trenton. Uh, and that became a, sort of a mini controversy on the side. But Lou Caden was, was our boss and he was really who we um, worked through and he had such a close relationship uh, with the governor and with uh, Dick Leone. Who was what at the time? State treasurer. Um, and both Dick and Lou had been key figures in the 73 campaign together. So they were um, uh, uh, extremely effective, I think, in working together. Uh, and particularly in the beginning, I, I think uh, uh, Lou's intelligence, I had less direct contact with Dick, but Lou was just so smart, <laughs> he was scary. Uh, and I've heard other people in these interviews <laughs> describe him the same way. People are a lot smarter than I am who thought he was intimidating, too. Did you have much interaction with Brendan Byrne? Not in the beginning. You would occasionally uh, get in to meetings. And it was a very small staff. But the key decisions were made by Lou and Dick and Cliff Goldman and others, and the cabinet people, I think, directly with, with the governor. And Jerry English was also the legislative counsel. So the assistant councils, at least uh, when you started, didn't get a lot of direct contact. You would occasionally be brought in by uh, Lou to a meeting in which you had worked on or written a briefing memo uh, to sit in. And I think uh, over time, though, when you began to speak up in meetings or, or sort of had a confidence that you knew what you were talking about, uh, you, would, you would start to get more and more direct access. Uh, and the direct access, I think, increased after Lou left as counsel, uh, and the uh, you know other the councils who succeeded him, I think, tended to bring in the assistant councils more. Uh, first of all, they were coming in new themselves. Who succeeded Caden? Uh, well, Alan Handler uh, came in, and then Stu Pollock, uh, and John Degden was also counsel, I guess, in the. Uh, lead up to the 77 campaign before being named Attorney General. And Hayden and Pollock would get onto the Supreme Court eventually. Yeah, yeah and then Dan O'Hearn was counsel in the second, uh, in the uh, second term. And, and also, also would be, a, uh, I, uh, some people ask, well, why didn't you <laughs> get on the Supreme Court? And I, my excuse was actually by the, uh, I think the statute's the same, is that you have to be admitted to the New Jersey Bar 10 years before you can be appointed as a judge and I hadn't been 10 years by the end of the uh, Byrne administration in 1982. What's the next chapter in your history in the Byrne administration after arriving, interacting with DEP, the other agencies that you uh, had responsibility for? What, what, ha what comes next? Well, I think what comes next, and as I said, I joined at a very low point in the administration, so there was I think concern about the future as to whether Governor Byrne was going to run for re-election, whether he, if he did, whether he would get re-elected. So it was sort of a uncertain time among the staff, and there were you know a few people who left during those dark years uh, leading up to the '77 uh, election year, uh, thinking about you know what is the future going to going to hold. And our job wasn't very political, and I was never really into the political side very much. Uh, there were other people in the office who did more of that. Um, but I think we were all, you know, thinking about that, thinking about, you know, what are the prospects and is there some way to recover from the low poll ratings and so forth. Uh, I was 
I think, fairly pessimistic. I didn't think there was. This is before or after the income tax was passed? It, well, it was after, I think. Uh, I mean, after the income tax was passed, I, I think there was an initial feeling of uh, relief and uh, finally success, but then I think it hit home that politically uh, this was going to be a very difficult uh, hurdle to overcome in terms of the governor uh, running for re-election and uh, recovering. So from your vantage point, what was 1977 like? Oh, it was... Uh, an extremely exciting year. Uh, I mean, again, I think we started with the idea that uh, it was going to be a difficult um, campaign. Uh, there were so many um, people, you know, testing the waters to run against uh, Governor Byrne uh, in the primary, uh, and that's probably what did uh, save him, finally, was that uh, all these people announced and became candidates and split up the vote so that he won uh, with, uh, you know, a fairly low percentage of the vote. Uh, and I always thought that was unlikely. I mean, I remember John Degnan would always uh, ask me when something uh, positive had happened in terms of the governor's prospects or somebody endorsed him or whatever. And I told, I remember telling John, I said, John, I think that as when Brendan Byrne looks like he can win, then the other candidates will get together against one other, uh, behind one other person, and solidify the anti-Byrne vote, and then we'll be, you know, dead. Uh, but I was totally wrong. I mean, it showed how little political uh, skills I had. Um, uh, and that's really, you know, what happened is all the candidates stayed in the race and split up the anti-Byrne vote. I mean, if there was one anti-Byrne candidate, I suspect the governor would not have won that primary. Did you have anything to do with the campaign? Uh, yeah, I wrote speeches, papers. I mean, I, I don't think I ever went to the campaign headquarters physically. Uh, you know, an off time, I would, and I would write policy statements and positions that I thought would be helpful politically, but were, I think, geared toward um, the idea that they would be popular, you know, or help to some marginal degree in the campaign. Uh, but I didn't do, the only direct campaigning I did uh, was that uh, a few of us, Kathy Forsyth, who was the press secretary, and one or two others, I can't remember who else, but we were some weekend. Uh, the, we went down campaigning to, to the Columbus Farm Market, handing out flyers for Governor Byrne. And I remember one woman taking the flyer, looking at it, seeing his picture on the flyer, spitting at it, and tearing it up in little pieces, throwing it down on the ground, and start jumping on the flyer. And I. And then we decided that the Columbus Farm Market was not a good place to campaign, and I think we went somewhere else for the rest of the day. But that was the only direct campaigning I ever did. Um, but a lot of the people in the office, like John Degden, were out, uh, you know, doing much more active work in the campaign. So I had much more of a significant role within the State House, I think, because people were outside doing things. Uh, and I remember um, on election day in November, uh, there was an incredible rainstorm that flooded much of New Jersey, mostly North Jersey, uh, to the point where the path tubes were closed because they had become flooded. And the commuters from New York were expected to be strong burn voters because of the income tax and the impact it had that they would not have to pay the New York City tax, and uh, particularly in Bergen County, that we expected strong burn votes in Bergen. And when it was, uh, when the path was closed, and when it was raining so hard, we 
um, really were concerned, at least I was, I mean I wasn't, but it was, I was in the state house, I was there, and about three or four o'clock in the afternoon I got a call from Dick Leone, who was at the campaign headquarters, saying, uh, Don, you've got to draft an executive order to extend the hours of polling for two hours so that the commuters can get back from Manhattan to cast their votes. And I remember saying something to the effect that, uh, oh, and I think Dick Coffey was also on the line from the campaign headquarters, saying something to the effect that, uh, Dick, this is a, an ex executive order that you want signed from a governor who is a candidate in this election that would extend the hours for, of, of the statute which would help him in this election. And I said something like, you know, this is sort of like Latin America. I said, um, and he said, well, he said, we're really worried that we're not going to get those commuters home in order to vote. So I did write an executive order um, saying that because of the emergency and because of the problems in elections, um, uh, we were extending the hours, I think, to 10 o'clock at night. Um, thankfully, they didn't um, uh, move with that. I don't think, and I've spoken to Governor Burns since. He, he wasn't even aware of this and said he, probably, he would not have signed it if it had been presented to him, but it still exists somewhere in the state archives. I haven't found it yet, but it's somewhere there. Well, Byrne won, and I think most uh, people around him knew he was going to win by that point because Bateman's economic plan had been panned and because the rebate checks went out right before the election. Uh, did you know by election day that, that you were winners? Oh, I didn't. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if anyone was real confident, although, and again, I didn't see the sort of internal campaign polls that they were doing, so I was probably pretty ignorant about the inside knowledge, but I think most people were still very nervous going into election day. Uh, and uh, although the, I think the confidence had picked up since um, the Bateman-Simon plan was announced and by the um, critical reception it received, particularly from the press. I remember being at the press conference, which uh, I think Cliff Goldman pretty much ran and sort of picked apart the Bateman-Simon plan and showed the holes that it was in, uh, that, it, that it had. Uh, and that was very effective except that I wasn't confident that this message would get to the voters. I had the feeling that the State House press probably bought the criticism, but that I just didn't know how they could show in their, particularly their news coverage, these problems. I mean, the editorials are one thing, but I didn't frankly know how many people in New Jersey really made their vote, you know, made their decisions on how to vote on the basis of editorials. Uh, but I think there was a feeling that the message got out and I think it's always impressed me that, you know, despite when you take polls and shows that New Jerseyans have very little interest in government and politics, they do pay attention when there's something that affects them before an election, and they change their minds, uh, usually for good reasons. And uh, you know, and you can see, I think, elections over the years where public sentiment has radically shifted uh, in the last, say, ten days or a week before the election, where people really are focusing and deciding uh, on a candidate or an issue, uh, where they really have paid attention and, and made up their minds. Uh do you think it's an intelligent electorate in New Jersey? Well, I think that suggests that it is. Uh, I mean, despite you'll see polls that say, you know, X percentage you know, don't know the names of anyone, and, you know, most of them, well, not most of them, but the governor usually comes up highest in terms of public recognition, but congressmen, senators, you know, usually are pretty low in terms of recognition. 
And I think most of the uh, political scientists will tell you to the extent New Jerseyans care, it's more on local issues and sort of local uh, concerns with their mayors and councils than it is with uh, Trenton and, uh, and the state legislature and the state government. But uh, I think when it makes a difference, uh, yeah, they are intelligent and perceptive in uh, making up their, their minds on, uh, on public issues. Let's take a two-minute break, okay. and then we'll do the second term. Sure. Ready? Okay. Before we talk about the second term, you wanted to tell us about the Department of Agriculture. Yeah, I always found the department really interesting. Uh, in the state government, it has sort of an unusual structure. You know, the Secretary of Agriculture is appointed by the um, uh, Board of Agriculture, which essentially is uh, representatives of the agricultural interest groups, uh, soybean growers and so forth. And, uh, and I, know, I can't remember whether they nominate for approval by the governor or whether they can make a direct nomination. I've sort of gotten fuzzy on the law. But in effect, the Secretary of Agriculture is sort of not the, go the, the, go the governor's own person. Uh, and he's really representing the constituencies that relate to the Department of Agriculture, farmers, food processors, and so forth. Um, and in New Jersey's history, we've had very few secretaries of agriculture because they've stayed for many, many years, it, you know, outlasted most of the governors that they started with uh, and have uh, continued in uh, no matter which party uh, took office and had a very special role. I mean, uh, most, if not all of them, I think were probably Republicans, just given the background of, of where they came from and started. Uh, and some of them, like with the Byrne administration, were sitting in cabinet meetings of the Democratic governor. And I guess you were always a little bit concerned about where their loyalties uh, uh, lied. Um, uh, Phil Lampe was uh, Governor Byrne's Secretary of Agriculture uh, throughout his whole eight years in office. And uh, he was a... Uh, interesting character. He had a great feel for public relations and for press. Um, the department is very small. It used to have, I think, one of the smallest budgets of any of the state departments. Uh, and there were, over the years, many, I think, proposals to merge it into some other larger department for efficiency's sake. Or uh, I think maybe one or two of them surfaced during the Byrne administration. And I think we also looked into the issue of whether the department structure was really consistent with the state constitution and the governor's authority. I guess when we had some disagreements <laughs> with the department. Uh, but Phil Lampe, I think, through all those administrations, knew how to cultivate governors, no pun intended, uh, and stay on their good side during the various seasons. He would be often seen bringing over blueberries or strawberries to, to the state house uh, for the governors and their staffs. Uh, and he also, uh, uh, I think, uh, had really good relations with the uh, limited uh, press that covered the activities of the department and the legislature. Uh, he would also uh, host a uh, one-day tour each year. I don't know if they still continue to do it of farms. With the legi with legislators and I guess other local county officials uh, to go along to see uh, sort of model farms or food processing operations and the like. Um, I guess one issue I remember where we knocked heads a little bit with the department was that uh, I guess I got interested in and John Degnan also was interested I think in why New Jersey regulated milk prices and, and had minimum milk prices because it was a time when uh, on the federal side there was a wave of deregulation. The air, air, airlines were, uh, airline fares were deregulated during that time. Uh, and there was a, a general movement, I 
questioning why government should intervene in private markets and set prices. So I think we looked at the um, milk pricing program with some skepticism as to why uh, it should exist. Uh, there are some good reasons, but I wasn't, um, I think, knowledgeable enough at the time to, to understand it. In any event, I guess we had the governor chair a public hearing to get testimony on the issue. And I recall the hearing was in the, one of the state house uh, chambers, I think, maybe in the assembly chamber. And we got there and there was a table and I think I was sitting at the table. I'm not sure if John Degden was there too, but the governor was um, um, going to be the um, chairman of the, of the hearing. And then a few minutes before we started, Phil Lampy comes in with gallon jugs of milk and puts them on the table in front of us. Uh, and suddenly uh, we see this sort of flurry of photographers come up to the front of the room taking pictures and we're sitting behind these jugs of milk. And Phil had put on the front of the jugs of milk the minimum, the milk price in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, all the neighboring states, all the other neighboring states were higher than we were. So he was making the point that even with minimum milk price regulation, New Jersey still had the cheapest milk in the region. Of course, that was the photo that highlighted our hearing on minimum milk price regulation. But I think it showed how uh, skilled Phil was at public relations and press relations and trying to make his point. Um, and I don't think much happened with, <laughs> with our effort to, uh, 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 to abolish uh, minimum milk price regulation. We may have gotten some minor changes in the program. Uh, but, that, but I think Phil was um, uh, well known during his time for, uh, uh, for some of his uh, uh, performances in, in public forums. All right, let's go to the second term. Um, you still assistant counsel, or is that when you get promoted? Well, I, I was assistant counsel, I, th I think, through the end of the first term. And then one of the um, ideas that had been discussed uh, even before I joined the governor's staff was restructuring the governor's office and trying to deal with some problems that had been identified. And some of these may have even been identified uh, during the transition in 1973 before the governor took office in his first term. Uh, the structure of the governor's office in those days was the governor's counsel's office, uh, whose primary responsibility was legal, was to review legislation, uh, and other legal matters that affected the governor, uh, extraditions, pardons, commutations, signing of um, riparian grants, other legal documents that required the governor's signature, uh, uh, some other miscellaneous responsibilities, sale of state real estate. I was also, as an assistant counsel, counsel to what they call the State House Commission which is a body made up uh, of the governor, uh, legislative leaders, I think the treasurer, I don't know, about six or eight people, I've forgotten now, which at that time, I don't know if the structure has changed, had the um, responsibility to approve sales or leases of state real estate, uh, land, uh, the National Guard armories, anything else the state had but thought was surplus or wanted to get rid of. Uh, so that was another function. I guess that also brings up another anecdote that might be interesting. Uh, the Chancellor of Higher Education used to have a home in Princeton that was given him as being Chancellor. It was owned by the state. Uh, and the Chancellor of Higher Education, when Governor Byrne uh, in his first term was uh, Ralph Dungan. And Ralph uh, resigned, I guess, a couple years into the governor's first term. Uh, and when uh, he left, uh, it was decided that the new 
incoming chancellor of higher education, who was Ted Hollander, uh, would not be given a home. That became a minor issue that I think Ted Hollander discussed when he was interviewed as part of this series. Uh, but in any event, they decided that there was really no reason to give the uh, Chancellor of Higher Education a state-owned home to live in. Uh, so it was decided to put the home uh, on the market. In those days, uh, mortgage rates were very high. I think they were over 10 percent at the time. Uh, inflation was high. Uh, the real estate market was really very dead. So we put the house on the market. Uh, and it was a very nice home in a very upscale Princeton neighborhood. Uh, and it just sat there for months and months with no bidders. Finally, we got a bid. And we had a meeting in the State House Commission. Uh, and we talked about it. And they were, and all, I think all the members of the commission were, uh, you know, very pleased that finally they had gotten a bid to, to buy the home. Uh, and then about a week, Later, uh, someone discovered, I don't know if it was a newspaper or what, that the buyer was a cult uh, based in Morristown called the Circle of Friends, which was uh, headed by some older guy uh, who had recruited some very attractive young ladies <laughs> as part of this cult. And it was at least alleged at the time that they uh, would infiltrate political campaigns of legislators and others uh, to sort of gain influence, uh, for what reason no one, I think, ever quite knew. Uh, but in any event, I remember receiving a phone call from the uh, mayor of Princeton Township. I think, I think it was, uh, might have been Jay Blyman at the time. Um, after this broke, saying, can't you, you know, <laughs> reverse this and not sell to the cult? And legally, I didn't quite see how we could, but you know, we looked into it and decided we really couldn't. Um, finally, what happened was that the neighbors got together, uh, pooled their their uh, funds, and um, I think gave the cult a premium of I don't know fifty percent or so over their buying price and bought them out and then resold the house after mm. that. Uh, but in any event, to get back to I think the track I was on, uh, the council's office had a lot of responsibilities. I mean, in addition to the council's office, there was the press office, which, uh, as it sounds, you know, primary duty was to uh, staff the needs of the governor and the you press. Was Kathy Forsyth ran that? Well, it was Kathy Forsyth, Bob Comstock, Joe Santangelo. Uh, but the office, uh, at least in those days, was usually two professionals in addition to, you know, some clerical people uh, in general maybe two or three professionals. Uh, but it was very small, and they were pretty busy responding to questions from the media, and writing speeches, and handling press conferences, uh, and doing the other things that the press people do. Uh, and there was uh, Jerry English's operation, the Legislative Council. Uh, Jerry handled um, sort of relations with the legislature, but mostly from, oh, I guess counting the vote standpoint and also she handled interviews with prosecutors and prospective judges for appointment um, and uh, she had a very small staff Bob Torricelli Tom O'Neill were on her staff at different periods but I don't think I think typically she had maybe again two or three people uh, and as I said, the council's office was usually around a handful of assistant councils in addition to the council. I don't know how large the council's office got now, but I think it's much larger than it used to be. Uh, and there was a, uh, the title of executive secretary to the governor, which was usually the person who handled the governor's schedule, made sure the helicopter was on time or that the meetings were um, reviewed by the governor and also did some political liaison. Um, Charlie Corella uh, in the first term. What was term, the title of this office? Executive Secretary to okay. the Governor. Uh, and the Executive Secretary's function was uh, somewhat political. Uh, Henry Luther was also Executive Secretary to the Governor. Uh, and Charlie Corella, usually 
you know, people who were close to the governor personally or had some long relationship as both Charlie and Henry uh, did. Uh, Don Land started as Governor Burns' first executive secretary, who was uh, one of his early political uh, boosters uh, and chairman of the Union County uh, Democrats. Uh, but there was, it was a very thin staff. As an assistant counsel, I did everything from, you know, write speeches, write bills, um, you know, meet with the governor and mayors and freeholders, um, and also answer letters from second graders. I mean, there really wasn't a, a staff that they now have an office of what they call constituent relations. We didn't have any of those people to, to deal with the routine mail. So the routine mail used to come and be allocated to the assistant councils depending on what issue it dealt with. It was like environment, it would be sent to me for response. And it didn't matter if it was from a citizen, from a, from a you know, seven-year-old, uh, from a mayor, uh, you would get it to at least do a draft response either over your own name or draft a response over the governor's name or someone else or send it out to the department for, their to, for them to answer. So the workload was incredible and a lot of it was really a misallocation of time. Uh, and just handling the day-to-day -day firefighting of issues that came up uh, really consumed us. So I, I believe that Luke Hayden, Dick Leone, Cliff Goldman, others who um, thought about these things uh, came early on in the administration to feel that there should be a restructuring where there was a unit that could have a little bit more time to deal with longer term strategic and policy considerations uh, and not have to deal with the day-to-day -day, you know, issues that really consume the time of, uh, of the governor's staff. And that's how the Office of Policy and Planning was really created at the beginning of the governor's second term, and I was asked to be the first director. Um, and that was really also a challenge, you know, to set up a new unit and to figure out what it should do. Um, and um, I had sort of grandiose ideas, I guess, of what my new role would involve, and uh, I was uh, brought down to earth very quickly. <laughs> uh, what did you think it would involve? Well, I said policy and planning. I <laughs> director. I, I, you know, I knew that there were people in still in the office and uh, and in the cabinet who you know had very key roles. But I thought, gee, it gave me a pretty much um, uh, blank slate to do what I wanted and what I thought were important things to focus on. And I guess what I wanted to do was focus on the things that I thought the governor thought very important, urban policy, later Pinelands, which we'll probably talk about in more detail, um, transportation, some of the larger, and some of the larger development land use issues, Liberty Park, uh, some of the things that would be lasting, that would you know, make a difference for New Jersey over time. Uh, and those are the things that I, you know, I thought that would be interesting. But, but I wasn't quite sure what the governor had in mind uh, for this new office. And then I guess a few days after I was appointed, I got a call from Dottie Seltzer, who was his personal secretary. And she said, the governor wants you to come over and meet with him in his small private office, which really is uh, so small that only two or three people can fit in it. Uh, and I was all excited and took my yellow pad, getting my first uh, direction as to what I should be doing as policy and planning director. And, and the governor said, he said, Don, he said, I wonder if you could do something about those flies. And again, I thought I, like with Luke Hayden, I didn't understand him, because the governor also tends to mumble. Uh, I said, I'm sorry, Governor, what would you say? He said, those flies. He says, every time I go down to Island Beach, those flies just bite me like crazy. And I don't want to go down there anymore because they just eat me up. And at this point, I felt about two inches high <laughs> that this was my first assignment, was to get rid of the uh, greenhead flies at Island Beach State Park. Uh, so I said, OK, Governor, <laughs> I'll see what I can do and left and um, went back and after I think probably 
that night going out to get drunk or whatever. I, the next day I came in and started calling entomologists and meeting here at Rutgers with people about the green head fly, learning about their sex lives and uh, and what we could. And I did learn a lot. <laughs> I probably. Knew. I don't think you got rid of the flies. No, unfortunately. I did find out that we could, there were some things we could do, except that uh, I remember when we came up to Rutgers, I talked to people and they said, oh yeah, we, we have a project. And they sent us down a proposal to do like a study for a half a million dollars to figure out, you know, what to do. And uh, so when I saw that, I said, you know, this is just not going to work. Uh, but uh, no, another thing that could have been done, which somebody told me, was that they usually breed on the bay side because the seagrass washes up from inland. And if you just picked up all that dead grass, you would do a lot to take right. off their, their uh, breeding grounds. And I thought, Jesus, we'd just hire some high school you know, kids in the summertime to do, to do that. And, uh, but it got so complicated in the bureaucracy that you know, the flies are still there despite my best efforts. You're the first director of policy and planning that we've had in the governor's office. Uh, how big a staff did you have? About the same size as the council staff, I think four or five people. I mean, it would change once in a while when somebody would leave, um, but uh, generally about that. And uh, we were structured somewhat differently. I don't think I allocated the staff among departments. It was more among larger projects. Uh, one of the things that we did was create what we called the Cabinet Development Committee, uh, which uh, would meet monthly uh, and get the departments that were mainly involved in infrastructure and development like environmental protection, transportation, uh, labor and industry, uh, treasury, uh, and talk about major projects that were around the state and whether we should be for them or against them. And was there a way we could make them go quicker if we were for them? Uh, and what types of positions uh, we should be taking. Because there was a lot of criticism that there wasn't much, um, much cooperation or even communication among the various executive departments on major like development projects as to what positions they should be taken. Uh, and sometimes departments were acting across purposes on the same project because they weren't even communicating about it permit application or financing application. So I thought that one of the, the advantages we had at the governor's office was to put all the same people in the same room and say, you know, this project, who's got a piece of this project and what are you doing about it and where does it stand? Does uh, a particular project come to mind? Oh, the Met, we were very involved in the Meadowlands. With, at the time, there were various proposals for different shopping centers. Uh, I think there were at least three different shopping center proposals, sort of the precursors of Xanadu. Uh, and um, wisely or unwisely, <laughs> uh, the competing developers and landowners had all hired people that they thought were very close to Brendan Byrne <laughs> or had, you know, long standing relationships as lawyers to their. Uh, to their projects or consultants. Didn't or work. Well, actually, well, it worked to the extent that they were all so smart that they canceled each other <laughs> because of, you know we couldn't make a decision on the basis of who was representing whom because they were all equally close to the governor and we wouldn't have done that anyway. But uh, but there wasn't any one you know favorite son that would stand out among the three uh, competing applicants that we would have uh, you know bent over backwards to, uh, to decide for. What were the high point initiatives of your tenure as director of policy and planning? Well, I think the, the development of Liberty Park, which I think, which David Bardeen as environmental commissioner really deserves a lot of the credit, was something that I took a real special interest. Uh, I mean, it concerned me that New Jersey didn't have the types of attractions that were, you know, world class that would get us attention uh, and I thought Liberty Park had that potential. Still, don't think it's realized that potential, but it's 
but for what it is now, which is very nice, I think the Byrne administration deserves most of the credit. Uh, and I'm a little disappointed that since it, it hasn't gone further than, uh, uh, than it has. Uh, but uh, Liberty Park was something that I was really particularly interested in. I remember uh, going up uh, with representatives from the Rouse Corporation, which at that time uh, were sort of the uh, nation's leading urban thinker and developer. They were the developers of the, or the actually architects and designers of the Baltimore uh, Harbor Place uh, redevelopment also had worked in Boston. Uh, and actually, and, you know, had a very outstanding reputation for what they had done in older cities in terms of redevelopment. And uh, asked them to come up. I remember walking through the old railroad terminal in Liberty Park with them, and things were falling all over the places. There were wires all over. I mean, it was really falling apart. Um, and uh, as we were walking through, just coincidentally, I guess the maybe it was the QE2 or maybe even the older Queen Elizabeth just sailed right by the windows and it was just a spectacular sight. It was almost like we had staged it. Uh, but uh, uh, for one reason or another we couldn't get them to come up. We did put a, a small children's museum in the uh, terminal for a while but then local politics intervened and the uh, Jersey City people opposed the renewal of the lease for that children's museum. But I've always thought that uh, Liberty Park and the waterfront up there could be, you know, something like the Baltimore Harbor or um, something even better in terms of uh, attractions. With me. And the Science Museum was also something that I was very heavily involved in as policy and planning director. That originally was going to be uh, located out on I-280. Uh, I think 280, maybe it was I-80. Um, and I think I was the one who suggested Liberty Park as an alternate location. Uh, and they um, did you know, decide to build in Liberty Park. Uh, also, as, as in policy and planning, we got the circle line to stop at Liberty Park uh, on its, uh, on its uh, service to the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. I thought that was a, a nice uh, coup that we really you know, went out on our own and sold. Uh, to them. So that was a, an area that I think we had special interest in. Um, we also had, and this uh, also was something I was involved in as assistant counsel with environmental protection. We're very heavily involved with the Pinelands and uh, we interviewed the, the first prospective appointees to the Pinelands Commission, worked closely with the Pinelands Review Committee, which was the precursor to the Permanent Commission in the development of the plan um, and, uh, and, and also as policy and planning director we were pretty involved in Atlantic City development. Uh, another anecdote that I thought I almost lost my job on. I'm trying to remember if this, this might have been as an assistant counsel, I can't quite recall, it might have been a little earlier. But uh, I had thought that the casino proposals that were coming in were all sort of cookie cutter hotels that really weren't very interesting. They all wanted to just tear down what was ever on their lot and build a pretty tower. Uh, you know, most of them have evolved from that, but that was the original concepts of most of the uh, first casino hotels to be built in Atlantic City. Uh, and then I thought that the old Marble, Marble or Blenheim Hotel, which was sort of built like uh, a little bit like an Arabian mosque with a domed roof and almost a minaret, might have some potential for a different type of casino hotel. Uh, and I remember, and Bally's had bought the old Marble or Blenheim, and they had, like the other prospective casino operators come in with a proposal to tear it down, build a tower on the site. Uh, and I met with them, and I can't remember who the lawyers were or whatever, and suggested, well, why don't you make it into like a Monte Carlo style, elegant, high roller casino 
um, renovate the old sort of Arabian mosque element of the hotel, uh, make it much more upscale than the other casino operators so that you can you know, go to the high rollers and uh, have a little niche that they won't have. Uh, and it was very interesting. They came in with all sorts of studies about the psychology of gambling design and how you design casinos to make people act quickly. The mirrors and the noise is intended for people not to think, but just keep on putting their chips down or the money down. Uh, and that the design of the casinos are all to reinforce this sort of uh, uh, psychology of the gambler. Uh, and that when you built a much more laid back, elegant casino, people didn't act as quickly and didn't gamble as quickly, and that had an impact on the handle. And I thought that was interesting because it was something I had never knew about, but it was something among many things that I learned uh, in the job. But I kept on pushing them, uh, and finally I think they, they thought that uh, they would need my okay to get <laughs> their license, uh, and they came back with another would proposal. They hmm? Would they have? No, I think if they had pushed over my head, you know, they could have easily gone over me. Uh, but I don't think they knew that. Um, and I, you know, I thought I had a good idea. Um, so they did, you know, they spent the money to come in with a new plan that would keep the, you know, hotel and, and keep the, and do an elegant casino and do, and then do a tower next door with a more contemporary casino. So they were compromising. I thought that was fine compromise. Uh, and then coincidentally, I guess I was in the governor's office and, and we weren't even talking about Atlantic City, but somehow the, the, it came up. And he just offhandedly said, he said, oh, that Marble Blenheim is so ugly, they should just dynamite the place. And when I heard this, I said, uh-oh. I said, <laughs> I said if, he, if he knows what I've been up to, <laughs> I said, I'm toast. So I quickly left the meeting as soon as I could, went across the hall to my office and called, uh, I guess, the lawyer for Bally's and said, you know, on second thought, <laughs> Your first plan, I think, is the best. I mean, he probably thought I was nuts. Uh, but um, and then the postscript to this is that we used to each year have a uh, staff and cabinet retreat where we'd go away for a couple days and sort of discuss larger issues of the administration and where was the administration going and how to improve things. And we happened to be having the retreat at the Seaview Country Club, I think before the Marriott was uh, built. Uh, or maybe it was after the Marriott, but in any event. Marriott bought Seaview. Bought Seaview. Uh, but I don't know if they had built, well, I don't know if they had built the tower or not. But, but in any event, it happened to be on the day they were dynamiting the old Blenheim. And the governor made sure that he adjourned the discussion so that everybody could go up to the top floor to watch. And uh, I felt somewhat sheepish about this, but uh, I don't think he ever knew. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever told him the story until now. Uh, but that was, that was another thing that I think we were very heavily involved in is sort of the, you know, the development of Atlantic City and, uh, and it, it was another area that I was a little bit disappointed in, uh, you know, in terms of the slowness of the, of the progress. I think now things are starting to happen down there, but uh, it's been a good, I think, 20 years that was sort of treading water in terms of uh, redevelopment down there. And, uh, and, and he is, all, the governor has also said, I think one of the mistakes we made was not trying to force a regional authority over the area so that we would have more control over development uh, down there and more, more leverage. Why? There's something wrong with the way it's developed? Well, yeah, I think it's developed somewhat haphazardly. I don't think there's ha been an overall um, um, entity to sort of kickstart projects to come up with ideas on its own, particularly with non-gambling attractions. Uh, the things that have developed, you know, on the side, like minor league baseball and 
other things have had really mixed success. But, uh, but you know, I think it's a little little um, disappointing that uh, Atlantic City hasn't developed the diversity of attractions that you know you have in Las Vegas and other areas. So Liberty State Park, the Pinelands, Atlantic City development. What else? Well, urban policy. We were always very interested in urban policy, and the governor had made it a major priority, you know, through his, his whole time in office. Uh, toward the end of the administration, in the second term, we developed the proposal for a Community Development Bond Act. Uh, this was intended to create a pool of money that the state would administer, similar to the federal program at the time, which was called the UDAG program, the Federal Urban Development Action Grant program, which has gone by the wayside over the years. But it was intended to stimulate uh, development projects which would have uh, also larger impacts in their neighborhoods or areas. Uh, and it could be things like theaters, museums, uh, uh, and the like, um, things like the Liberty Science Center. Uh, Community Development Bond Act actually did get on the ballot. Um, I think it was in, well, I don't know if it was in November of 1981, right before the governor left office in January of 82, or maybe the next year, but it was our proposal. It did pass narrowly. There was a lot of opposition because it was viewed as an urban, you know, bill, and it, a lot of people voted against it. Remember for, the size of it? I think it was about 85 million, maybe a little larger. Uh, but it did fund the first 10 million of the um, Performing Arts Center in Newark. Although Tom Kane legitimately gets the credit, the Byrne administration put the first money into the into the Arts Center uh, through the Community Development Bond Act. Um, I don't rem remember what else was used by the uh, funds, but the Performing Arts Center was one of the larger recipients of the first round of uh, grants from the project. What was your role in the Pinelands? Well, it started when I was an assistant counsel, primarily because I was the liaison to environmental protection. Uh, and this was another initiative that Dave Bardeen really sparked. Uh, the, there was an entity called the Pinelands Environmental Council that was created by statute that was uh, largely controlled by the counties in the Pinelands area. Uh, and was chaired by a uh, fairly prominent Burlington County politician named Jay Garfield DeMarco, fellow Dartmouth one, by the way, who was a uh, cranberry grower and landowner down there. And an activist Republican. Activist Republican for many, many years after, uh, until I guess relatively recently. But in any event, uh, the Pinelands Environmental Council came out with a plan uh, which Bardeen read and looked at and I think called a developer's dream or something that was very pro-development, at least according to Bardeen. I don't know if I ever read it. But Bardeen blasted the plan and sent a memo over to the governor suggesting that the governor you know, take this on. Uh, the governor, even before this, had gotten an interest in the Pinelands, and I think he's discussed this uh, in some of his uh, interviews uh, through the book written by John McPhee about the Pinelands. Uh, and the governor knew McPhee personally. They played tennis together. I think he also you know, may have this running. I guess he went to law school with McPhee's brother or whatever. but. Uh, in any event, he had a fairly close personal relationship with McPhee, and at the end of McPhee's book, uh, McPhee went through the history of the Pinelands and the special, you know, unique environmental resources and the water, the sand uh, down there. But at the end, he said, and also talked about the various proposals in the 60s, I guess it was a proposal to build one of the jet ports to serve Manhattan and Philadelphia in the Pinelands. Uh, but at the end of the book, Buffy had a statement saying probably nothing will happen because the politicians are too weak or something to that effect. 
And the governor took that as a personal challenge that he wanted to prove McPhee wrong. Um, and uh, obviously the governor's a better person to talk about that. But in any event, the governor really told us he wanted to do something in Pinelands. And this started in the first term. And Bardeen was also, I think, on the same page as the governor in terms of doing something. Most of us felt that this was a fight that really we didn't need. I mean, we had the problem of the income tax. We had made enough enemies on that. We had, you know, other problems. We didn't see that, you know, there were many, many people to win over with this on the staff. Uh, most of us, frankly, were from North Jersey. We didn't have many people who were familiar with the Pinelands. Uh, I don't think I'd ever been down there. And we um, uh, were somewhat reluctant, I think, to sort of take up this baton and run with it, uh, b both because we didn't find it politically feasible and we weren't sure it was ever going to, you know, be practical in terms of getting anything through the legislature. So there was a lot of delay on the staff side, I think, in acting on what the governor asked us to do. Um, and I think that from time to time annoyed him because he didn't see much action. And it was probably delayed a little bit, uh, well, maybe delayed for several months because people weren't pursuing his, you know, his direction. Um, and, uh, but we were, but I, I was personally involved in the drafting of the bills. Um, I guess one of the contributions I made was uh, looking at one of the early drafts, I think by Mike Catania or Dave Maddock, who were the legislative services staff people who actually did most of the drafting for the environmental committees in the Senate and the Assembly. Um, they had, oh, and uh, I guess one of the first things that we were, that we were puzzled about is how to define what the Pinelands were. People talked about the Pinelands, but they all had different sort of conceptions of what the geography was, where it, you know, where was the boundary? There wasn't any clear boundary for the Pinelands. Um, and I thought, you know, having to draw the boundary would be so politically difficult as to which towns were included, which weren't, that again, it would be politically impossible to get anything through because people would say, well, why, why is this town in and I'm not and so forth, because there was no real map at the point, at that point to, you know, say that this is the Pinelands. Uh, and I came across a study that had done by, had been done by Rutgers for the Department of the Interior, which I think was a, for water planning purposes. But it drew a map, and, but it drew a very expansive map um, defining the Pinelands. And I thought, well, geez, at least that's something to start with. But it was so large, I thought, well, geez, this will get whittled down, but at least it's something to put on the table and let people fight about it. Uh, but I thought, frankly, that that would finally get narrowed down to a very small inner area, if any, if we could get anything through, uh, through the legislative process. Uh, but I thought, well, geez, if we end up with that little, you know, sort of hole in the donut at the end of it, that's, that's something uh, rather than this huge area. Uh, uh, what happened, in fact, was that the large area stayed in the bill, really did not get whittled down hardly at all. Um, and I think primarily because the more politically astute people like Harold Hodes and others who knew how to deal with the legislature said, well, if we've got this map, we can't start negotiating with one legislator to get this town out or in because it won't stop if we open that door. And they didn't, and they held very firm to this huge area, which is the current area under regulation by the by the by the Pinelands Commission, was it tough getting the legislation passed? Oh, okay. it was it was very tough. I mean, it was uh, a series of you know meetings of uh, cajoling. I mean, I was I was not really involved too much in the legislative negotiations. 
Um, but was, but it was highly controversial. Oh, it was highly controversial, and there were key people like Steve Persky, uh, uh, others who, in the, other particularly South Jer Jersey Democrats, John Russo, John Paul Doyle, um, uh, Daniel Newman, you know, who were concerned about, you know, I think the political impact in their districts of of this initiative because it was very controversial down was, there. Was there a compensation aspect uh, involved well, in the taking of or, or the reduction of the value of land? We had some generic language about compensating through development credits and exchanges, but this was all somewhat airy-fairy, I think, to the landowners down there. It was the idea that you could designate areas that couldn't be developed but then give the landowner some rights to develop in an era, another area or trade those credits, a lot like the environmental sort of trading banks that are discussed today about emissions uh, credits. Uh, but it was, you know, general language. It wasn't cash. Uh, we also were going to put some money in, I think we called the Pinelands Development Credit Bank, which is, was supposed to guarantee the value of these credits for landowners who were going to be prohibited from developing. Um, but again, I don't think it persuaded a lot of the opponents. And a lot of the opponent, a lot of the opposition was political. It, it was an area that was largely Republican. Um, Garfield DeMarco and some of the other people were very vocal critics of the whole process. It's often said that the, the Pinelands is Brendan Burns' legacy or his greatest achievement. Uh, to what extent do you share that view? Oh, I, I do share that view. Uh, the extent of the area, whether it was accidental or not, that really is under regulation, is so extensive that it has impacts way beyond the boundaries of the Pinelands. It's about one-fifth of the state of New Jersey. Yeah, but, but also the geographic placement. First of all, it's sort of a buffer between Atlantic City and the Delaware Valley. Uh, and I can't say that this was planned, but with the development that occurred in Atlantic City and its immediate region, if you didn't have the Pinelands regulation, much of that development would have eaten up the forest uh, because it would go on to the cheaper land to the west. By putting the Pinelands in effect, we essentially confined that area, I think, uh, it's somewhat sorry that not some more of that development didn't go, didn't go into Atlantic City itself, went into Egg Harbor and other areas right out on the outskirts. But if you didn't have the Pinelands, it would have gone much, much further. Uh, I think the other thing that it did, which uh, I remember Brendan Burns saying, is that he didn't want South Jersey to develop with the sprawl that North Jersey had experienced. And he felt that by concentrating development in existing towns and areas, that we'd be doing a lot more to, you know, have South Jersey uh, follow a much more, I think, uh, uh, planned approach to its uh, long-term development than had been uh, occurring in his old bailiwick in North Jersey. While we changed tapes, you told me you uh, played an historic role in the creation of New Jersey Transit. You want to reprise well, that? A very minor but lasting <laughs> role. But I didn't have an awful lot to do, to do with it, but I remember Lou Gambaccini uh, called me one day and said, we're drafting this bill to create this new entity, uh, and we've got a, I guess, disagreement as to whether to call it the New Jersey Transit Authority or New Jersey Transit Corporation. And he said, what do you think? And I said, corporation, I think that sounds much more efficient, and that was my one, I think, significant contribution to the issue. Amazing. We assume that there, there's more meaning to, to that than simply it <laughs> no. sounded good to some guy's ear. Well, I mean, I think that raises the larger point. I think people from the outside usually think that there's much more thinking and planning and strategy to a lot of these decisions than there really are. I mean, in most cases, there really isn't an awful lot of uh, thinking or conspiracies or whatever. It's just sort of accidental or happens to I think I've observed that <laughs> from years and years of watching this stuff. Um, what about uh, the completion of I-95? Tell us that story. Yeah, I can't recall whether, I think I must have been involved more as director of policy and planning than uh, as an assistant counsel, because I can't quite remember the year. Uh, 
but the interstate highway system was in the sort of final stages of being completed and all the states were being pressed to make decisions on which segments of the interstate system uh, they were going to complete or not and if you didn't complete them you had to request approval from the Federal Highway Administration to de-designate the interstate as part of the system and I guess provide some justification as to why. Uh, and in New Jersey, the principal decisions were between finishing I-95 from where it crosses the state uh, just north of Trenton and Hopewell uh, to connect up farther north. Uh, uh, and I think the connection was, su was supposed to be somewhere in Montgomery Township uh, across, uh, inter across two, uh, uh, State 206. Uh, or 287, which was essentially a belt way in the northern part of the state going over into New York and into, you know, sort of skirting around New York to New England. Uh, and we were, I think, being pulled, you know, different ways. Why uh, could you only do one of them? Why couldn't you do No, that? we could have done two of them. Uh, but we were getting lots of criticism by environmentalists about highway construction, particularly through some relatively rural uh, areas of the state. Um, and we were getting sort of counter pressure from labor and construction interests who obviously saw jobs benefits. Uh, and we were getting, I guess, um, different advice from planners as to, you know, which uh, or both of the, of the highways made sense. Uh, we, and I think politically, and I maybe it was before the governor ran for re-election, I think we were concerned a little bit about the impact that a no-build decision would have on labor uh, and support. Uh, I'm not sure he ever thought of that because he tended not to think of those things. We did more of the worrying than, than he did. Uh, but, the, but at least in my mind, that was an issue as to whether you know, we could annoy you know, labor if, by not building either of the roads. Uh, I think the governor had the feeling that I-95 was going to be very difficult to go through because it was going through some very wealthy areas uh, to the west of Princeton, um, some very powerful you know, family interests, old line family farms and things, and that it would be uh, politically difficult. I guess in the beginning I thought, well, I-95 made the most sense and I guess, in my own judgment, uh, I thought, geez, it would be nice to get people from not taking Route 1 and the Turnpike, which I always thought was an ugly road, and tried to do some things about in other, you know, other time. Um, but I, I, and I didn't know too much about I-287. Uh, and I think we did, well, the governor decided, and I think, not on my advice, but I mean, he decided that I-287 was the one that made the most sense. And we were also, I think, getting advice from the Department of Transportation that even if you built I-95, it wouldn't really take much of the traffic off of Route 1 and the other roads. So the other thing was the Turnpike was concerned of a you know, competitive free road, you know, sort of paralleling its path to the west. Uh, so we decided just to build the I-287 and to de-designate I-95. I guess I read someplace where there are people now trying to revive the idea of finishing I-95. And all I know is that I-95 North suddenly becomes I-295 South. I mean, it's very confusing. <laughs> yeah. It's still it's confusing to me. And I, I I know people driving up from North Carolina must be they have a problem. Must yes. be incredibly confused. And the Turnpike is also now I ninety five. Yeah, they, actually, the I I ninety five designation is now going to the Turnpike, but I believe that the I ninety five segment in New Jersey is the only part of the interstate system, at least on the East Coast, that has not been completed. Huh. I think I saw that on the internet someplace. Uh. You wanted to tell us uh, a little about the allocation of racing days in Monmouth County. Well, yeah, it was um, an issue at the sort of end of the administration. I, I was serving then 
after Dan O'Hearn was appointed to the Supreme Court as both the chief counsel and the policy and planning director. And I remember... Why? Too hard to hire a new one six months before <laughs> I, I you're leaving? I didn't want to give up both titles, or the, my one other title. I should have given it up. I mean, there was... Uh, I had a deputy director named Jack Houston, who was a really sharp Kennedy School graduate who was going on to great career success in business, um, who really was running the policy segment in the last six months of the administration but I didn't give up the, the title. Uh, but in any event, there was a bill uh, to reallocate racing days between Monmouth Park and Freehold Raceway, uh, both in Monmouth County. But, um, and it was, you know, it was not a big issue, but it was when, you know, one more track would close and the other could open and so forth. And between the tracks, I guess it meant some money, depending on what dates they wanted. And the largest shareholder at the time in Monmouth Park was David Wilentz, the former attorney general and the famed prosecutor in the Lindbergh kidnap baby trial. And longtime Middlesex County Democratic uh, uh, power. Uh, and he uh, obviously had a strong interest in Monmouth Park. Uh, and Freehold Raceway was represented by another prominent lawyer, Bernie Hellring, from a prominent Newark uh, corporate law firm. So the governor asked me, he said, well, call Hellring and Willance and ask them to come to Morvin and let's talk about this bill and have it done. So we did, and we had a meeting scheduled at Morvin. I got to Morvin, the governor was there. And then David Willance uh, arrived. Uh, and we're still waiting for Hellring. So the governor said, well, I think he called him general at the time, I think. He said, let's all go back to the small den in the back of Morvin and uh, you know, wait for Bernie Hellring to get here. And it was also about at the time that the um, widow of Bruno Hauptmann was trying to open up the files of the case or renew the case and had petitioned the governor, and the governor was a real scholar of the Lindbergh kidnapping case. He had gone over to the State Police Museum, gone through the evidence files. He knew much more than I did about the details of the case. Uh, so he had a real strong interest in the case. But anyway, as the three of us are sitting there waiting for Bernie Hellring to get, get there, uh, the governor turned to um, David Wilentz and he said, uh, he said, tell me, General, do you really think Houtman was guilty? And I was sitting there and I said, gee, this is history. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking, I, was, I didn't say a word. I said, I really wish I had a tape recorder. Uh, and David Wilentz just sat there for the longest time without saying anything, just sort of nodding at the governor, not nodding, but just sort of moving back and forth in his chair. Uh, and finally he said, he said, Brendan, let me put it this way. He said, if he didn't do it, he went to his death knowing who did it. And the governor didn't ask anything more. I didn't think it was my place to cross-examine uh, David Valence, but I guess what I came out of that is saying he wasn't sure, that he really wasn't sure. And I just thought, you know, that little bit of history, you know, should have been uh, memorialized in some way. Very interesting. Let me ask you about Brendan Byrne. Uh, was he a good politician? Oh, I think in those days we thought he was a terrible politician. Uh, except that when you had the luxury of more perspective and looking at the judgments he made, he was an incredibly astute politician. I mean, he was a politician who wouldn't do the things that typical politicians usually do. And I guess we used to think on a staff he should do. Uh, he didn't like to do the schmoozing. I mean, he's, I think, admitted many times that he was not the type of governor like Dick Hughes, who just loved the sort of glad handing, the uh, uh, 
speech making. Uh, uh, he he didn't like that part of the business. He didn't like I think a lot of the artificial nature of what politicians do now in terms of uh, their public persona. Uh, but he had such a sharp mind in terms of the, I think, essential politics and what was important. Uh, I remember him saying once, and I'll clean it up some, but, but he said, you know, he said, 99% of what comes across my desk is uh, chicken droppings. Uh, and he was right, and we used to sort of worry about the 99%. <laughs> where he was looking at the 1%, the things that made a difference over the longer term, uh, the things that really, you know, where his position as governor uh, and his place as an individual in the governor's office made a difference. Uh, I mean, on the Pinelands, uh, that would never have happened without Brendan Byrne, the individual as governor of New Jersey. Uh, he had to force it down our throats as staff people. Uh, he was the one who really pushed on that. It was not something that came up, you know, from the bottom, from constituencies. The environmental groups were not the advocate. Oh, they were supporters, but they weren't key in in any way in getting a, in getting it accomplished. In some cases, they were, I think, counterproductive. It was Brendan Byrne really pushing from the top to do something that wouldn't happen. And I think that's the way he would judge the performance of governor. So, would this thing have happened without me? I remember him saying, well, the income tax would have happened at some point. You know, if I didn't get it done, it was inevitable that the next governor or the governor after that, because it would have uh, been something that sooner or later the state would say, well, we can't keep resisting this. That, it, you know, it, it, it's going to happen. So that his personal role in that, I think he felt was, you know, much less significant than it was in something like the Pinelands, where he really pushed something that wouldn't have happened without, without him in that office. You paint a picture of a man who sees far off into the distance while others are looking at a, a closer, uh, you know, a closer aspect. Is that? How you see him? Oh yeah, I, th I think that's very accurate. Uh, he had a calmness about him when we were all, you know, running around, you know, like chickens with their heads cut off, uh, firefighting on this issue or that issue. Uh, that again, you know, you have to sort of sort these things out to see what are the more important things and what are the things that you should be setting your priorities about. Uh, so he. Um, uh, I think he had that longer term perspective that a lot of us, you know, on the staff level lacked. Um, and, he, and also calmness. I mean, he's discussed this in his interview as to why. I mean, some people have suggested it was his military experience in the war and being shot at and so forth. And I think he sort of um, uh, not accepted that <laughs> uh, argument so much. But he, did, but he did have a calmness about him, and I think, in trying to deal with some of these major issues, even when, uh, you know, he was at the lowest point in the polls and people who were criticizing him. I remember when I was an assistant counsel opening a letter and taped to the top of the letter were nails and the letter said, Governor, I hope these are the last nails in your coffin. Um, and he was subject to such, you know, abuse and criticism. But he, you know, but I think he, he kept that perspective about him even through the worst of those times. How would you describe his style of leadership? Much different than, <laughs> I think, typical political leaders today. Um, you know, he was not the rah-rah type of um, cheerleader, either, you know, privately with the staff or, I think, out in the public. Uh, in his first term, I thought he was terrible as a speaker. I thought he handled press conferences badly. I mean, he seemed uncomfortable. Um, he, um, you know, didn't go out of his way to ingratiate himself, uh, himself with, you know, with people, uh, he wouldn't do the types of things that the politicians do 
I think, as a matter of course today. Uh, after he was reelected, I think he got much more comfortable in the job. Uh, and he, I think he got a lot more confidence. And I think one thing politicians learn, particularly when they run in a campaign, is that they learn a lot, even despite themselves. <laughs> I mean, people ask them questions. Uh, you know, maybe the first time they don't know the answer, but probably the second or third time they've learned enough that they, they know the answers. Um, and I think Brendan Byrne in that 77 re-election really uh, came back after his victory knowing more about New Jersey and the issues and what people were talking about than anybody, uh, particularly in the, on our staff or, or probably anybody in the state. I mean, it's a force-fed education when you campaign in a hotly contested race, and, uh, and he really you know, knew his stuff uh, after that 77 campaign. I think it showed in his uh, confidence and his humor um, and, his, uh, and his ability in the second term to be a much more, I think, uh, public figure in terms of talking and his, and, and, and his you know, sort of style. Uh, and he was, I think he was a much different type of politician in that, in that second term than he was in his first term. And finally, you are now sort of the keeper of the burn flame. Uh, you know more about the burn years than perhaps anybody uh, because of this project that you're directing and maybe anyway. Um, why? Well, I'm trying. I mean, I, I remember when I was uh, counsel at the end of the administration, uh, I was asked by the uh, state archivist to send over the files from the governor's office for uh, safekeeping in the state archives. And I was told that prior administrations, maybe all the prior administrations, had gone through all their files and purged and thrown away and torn up materials they didn't want. Uh, preserved or looked at, and I thought, and I, I guess we st I started to look through my own files and through other files, and finally, after you know a few hours of doing this, I said, I said, why should I do this? I said, I said, I don't think we've done anything wrong. <laughs> I don't think there's anything embarrassing. Uh, and also, I said, I don't want to do all this work <laughs> going through thousands of papers. Um, so I didn't, and we essentially sent the files over, you know, unlooked through, unreviewed, unpurged uh, to the state archives where they are today. And I guess uh, the uh, punishment for that decision is now I'm going back to the state archives to go through those papers to try to find what's interesting and to make them public. But it always, uh, I thought, was a little bit sad that uh, New Jersey does so little in terms of historical uh, research and sort of gives people a, a better idea of how these decisions get made uh, by Governor Byrne, by other governors, in terms of what is the advice, good or bad, and, and what they relied on. Uh, as we discussed, you know, are these decisions largely accidental uh, or coincidental rather than planned or strategic or conspiratorial? Uh, and I think that this project is intended to give a little bit better light on uh, some of this history that uh, makes uh, New Jersey a pretty interesting place to live.